So today is a very special day because we have a special blend of East and West. We have an all-star panel for you. We have Shark from Shark Tank US and we have Sharks from Shark Tank Vietnam. Shark Kevin Harrington, an original shark on the hit TV show Shark Tank, co-founding board member of the Entrepreneurs Organization. Shark Ling Thai, the only female named shark in the Shark Tank Vietnam season 1 and 2, founder of the TVL Group. Shark Louise Nguyen, guest shark in Shark Tank Vietnam, chairman of the board of director of Saigon Asset Management. Of course, I love Shark Tank in the US, um, and Kevin, big fan of yours. He's a great marketing guy. What, what else can I say? Is that right, Kevin? Oh, hey, I'll take all the compliments. <laughs> today. Thank you. Investing into startup is probably um, having about 1% success. I don't want to uh, discourage uh, investors or, or startups so like, oh my God, only 1% success. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm getting more positive now with 1% to 10% success rate. 1% that would be like a home run, a unicorn, like a big IPO. But there's still like another 5% that eventually get bought out by other companies. And maybe 10% would be what you call the walking dead. So, so they don't know anywhere, they're just flat. Whether you come up with a formula for investment into startups? A PPM, a people product market. Test before I invest. Has your appetite for investment changed pre-COVID and during COVID? I had my best year ever during in, in the last 14, 16 months. Before COVID, I was already thinking about the edtech space, uh, and you know, when when COVID hit, it was just kind of made sense. It has to be cross-border, meaning it has cannot be language sensitive or cannot be culturally sensitive. In order for that to work, you really need a strong home base. I, I love the global aspect because products, if something worked in the United States, it generally was going to work in most other countries around the world. So now we like to partner with the best of the best around the world. She and I should do some investments together. So maybe we can talk and see what we can bring into the Vietnam market. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. All right. If there is one keyword you want to leave to all the startup founders watching the show today, what would be that one word? So hello everyone and welcome back to Nguy Ke, Risk and Opportunity Season 2, broadcasting on multi-channels on VN Express. You know, we, we are amidst the uh, tough time of having COVID and the pandemic all, all over us. And um, I, me, myself, and all of the team, the production team at Mwika, we have been working behind the scene just to stay strong and to bring some positivity into your day. You, as you can see, I'm wearing a blue and green scarf as well to signify hope. And hope is what we need for now and hope together we bring it to the future. So today is a very special day because we have a special blend of East and West, and we have an all-star panel for you. We have, um, you know, sharks from Shark Tank US, and we have sharks from Shark Tank Vietnam. So I have to say that you really have to focus and you really have to take some notes and, um, and enjoy the show. Um, welcome to Nguyen's special edition original shark from Shark Tank US, um, Shark Kevin Harrington, and from Shark Tank Vietnam, Shark Louis Nguyen, and Shark Thai Vang Lin. Hi, um, Kevin, Louis, and Lin, welcome to the show. And I'm going to start the show with you saying hello and introduce yourself to the audience, but I'm going to do it in a reverse pitch of one minute. So you gotta you you listen to the startups pitching to yourself already. Now you're gonna reverse pitch to everyone um, in the audience. You have one minute. You can say whatever about yourself as long as you are comfortable with it. So uh, let's start with Kevin. Your one minute starts now. Okay, thank you. I, I've been an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur for over 40 years. And back about 40 years ago, I, I was watching cable television and The channel went dark and there was no there was no programming for six hours. So I cut a deal to buy that six hour block of time. And th this is back in the early 80s. I started putting products on. I built the S Seaman TV industry in the United States to many billions of dollars. And I took companies public along the way. 
Uh, so I, I'm an entrepreneur. And then I got the phone call from Mark Burnett to be on Shark Tank. And I shot the original pilot and, uh, and many, many segments. So happy to be here. And um, I'm not just an as seen in TV guy. I, I had sold th those assets about nine years ago. And now I'm an advisor, an investor, and I sit on boards and I help companies get started and grow and go global. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic pitch. Um, sh should we follow up with Lynn? Okay. Um, let's see. Hard to follow. Hard act to follow. Um, all right. So, um, hi, my name is Lynn Tai. I have about 20 years of work experience, about half of which have been in investing both in venture capital funds and corporate venture capital funds. And then the other half has been in entrepreneurship, starting my own company in fashion technology, as well as now education technology. And so uh, what I'm working on now is I'm CEO of a consulting company focused on training content for young professionals. And so what we're doing is skills bridge training, bridging the gap between university and a manager level at work. And I'm using all of my prior experiences to create uh, short modules uh, that are micro learning focused and that really are focused on core, uh, core deliverable, actionable steps um, so that people can really, you know, get out there and advance their careers and their lives. Thank you, Link. Uh, Luis, your one minute starts now. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. I'm Louis Nguyen. I'm uh, born in Vietnam and came to the US in 75. Uh, I grew up in a town called Sunnyvale, California, which is uh, what you call Silicon Valley now. So I grew up in Silicon Valley. I worked in uh, public accounting and all the tech companies and eventually I got in venture capital back in the late 90s. Uh, in 2003, I came back to Vietnam with the invitation of IDG Ventures to set up the IDG Ventures Fund. Uh, and I came back again in 2005 permanently in Vietnam to work for Vina Capital. Uh, and we raised at the time close to two and a half billion dollars uh, because there was euphoria about Vietnam in the capital markets, real estate and so on. Um, moving forward, I, I, in 2007, I left Vina Capital to start my own firm. We have an AUM about roughly 250, 300 million dollars. And we invest in various companies uh, and sectors in Vietnam, both the real estate and companies. Uh, but our latest uh, platform invests in companies that uh, benefit the, the environment, social, and uh, uh, that have great governance. So um, that is our platform. The latest is more on the sustainable side. So great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Isn't it fun to hear pitches from, uh, from the sharks instead of from startups? <laughs> okay. so, it makes um, talking about yourself a little bit harder. <laughs> So I'm going to continue with a mini game, all right? So in front of me, I have four boxes representing addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So as an entrepreneur and uh, as a sharp investor, um, what calculus would you choose to start with when you start your business in Vietnam or wherever, wherever you are? Um, just choose one, and then I'll pick all the questions from that particular box um, and read the questions to you. Okay, so I'll start with Kevin. Kevin, which one do you choose? Multiplication. Okay, here we go. Okay, first question for Kevin. If you could act as a character in a movie, who would it be? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I like um, hero type movies. I think um, uh, it's funny. Uh, this is a good, good uh, tie-in. When we shot the original Shark Tank, pilot, we were sh we shot on the Sony movie lot. And right next to us was the Iron Man show with Robert Downey Jr. So um, they were shooting that show and we, we ended up mixing with the crews and so on. And actually we heard the movie being produced because there was lots of uh, explosions <laughs> from our set to their set. So I would say, uh, I love Robert Downey Jr. has been an amazing comeback story and um, Iron Man. So I'm going to go with, with Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man. That was, that was a good movie. Kevin, the Iron Man. I will remember that. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Matt, with Lynn, which one would you choose? I'll go for divide because I feel like you should share the wealth and you know, share the work. So you go for divide because you want to share. Okay? If you could go back 10 years, what would you say to yourself at that time? Uh, that things are going to get better. I would never want to go back in history because it feels like every day or every year has gotten better. Um, you know, so 
you know, to, to the young folks that are watching this, life gets better as you get older. But I think when I was in my 20s, I thought, oh, my God, 40 was so old. But now that I'm over 40, I'm like, this is great. I think like 45, 50, 60, that's just, just going to get better. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I would just tell myself, look, be patient. Things get better. And, you know, just, just keep working. That's why you always stay positive. Yes. <laughs> okay, Louis, back to you. Which one would you select? Okay, since since Lynn is so so positive, I have to go the the opposite. Let's let's go to a negative uh, minus. Place. <laughs> the yin and the yang. Huh? <laughs> okay, Mr. Minus, Mr. Minus. Okay, let's get Mr. Minus some questions. If you could invent something, what would you invent? Ooh, invent something. I yeah. I would invent something that would uh, prevent global warming. I would mm-hmm. invent something that would. Uh, make sure that our ocean is, is saved and that uh, the river is clean and people have clean water. So it's something that would bear, stop this earth from dying. Invent to prevent. I love it. Okay, guys, so we're going to go back to the main part of the show. And I want to start with Shark Tank because you're all Shark Tank guess um so my first question would be give me one reason why you become a shark maybe ladies first maybe then you can go first sure okay so one of my um guilty uh, pleasures is reality tv i love reality tv so of course i love shark tank in the u.s um and kevin big fan of yours watched uh, you know from the first season forward and uh so and i really saw the impact that shark tank us had on the community, right? I mean, it was, I mean, for me, it was eye opening too, just seeing people's perspectives, uh, seeing, uh, you know, all the advice that, that's being given on the show. I mean, sure, you know, some of the sharks are a little bit aggressive, but you still get a lot of learning from it. So then when the producers here commented, I mean, uh, call, called me, I thought, oh my goodness, right? So this just kind of fulfills two bucket list items. One is to be on a reality TV show. And then uh, two is to, you know, just play a bigger role within the community. At the time, I was doing venture capital investing, which I think is a whole different beast. Uh, it's different types of companies, different types of entrepreneurs. And I think Shark Tank really addresses the masses, and it really addresses kind of that the average person that really just wants that has an idea and wants to kind of improve their lives and, and really kind of take a product to market. And so I thought it was really a great opportunity to continue to help grow the uh, startup ecosystem in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. What about you, Luis? I never plan to be on Shark Tank. I'm actually, I think uh, uh, financial guys like me, a little bit more conservative. We're, we're actually private people. We, we actually don't want to be in front of the camera um, because what we do is, is kind of a little bit conservative. So, but, uh, but when I met the Shark Tank producer and we discussed this issue, it, it, it's about um, what, can I, what can I do to give back to the community? What can I do to take my experience in Silicon Valley, invest in uh, startup companies in the U.S. and here in Vietnam and our Experience in this in the capital market uh, investing there to to share with uh, with the uh, young entrepreneur of Vietnam because uh, for countries like Vietnam in order to get out of poverty it has to come through innovation it has to come through with higher end of the food chain instead of making shoes making stuff for 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 other countries so so I thought at least that I can do is to contribute back into the entrepreneurial uh, community. Uh, to uh, to support them through capital, through know-how, so that way uh, we can uh, be stronger, similar to the South Korean or the Taiwanese. Fantastic. Thank you, Luis. And the original shark on Shark Tank US, Kevin. Thank you. So as a, a product, as seen on TV, uh, entrepreneur, I used to go to all the trade shows. Right? I had to do the houseware show for houseware, hardware show the beauty shows, the golf shows, amazing new golf products, right? So I I would do about 25 trade shows a year. And every time I'd go to the shows, I I would often, I would speak and in front of the crowds and I would get dozens, if not hundreds of people would come to me afterwards and say, can I help them? Can I help them? And I realized that the, there's so many entrepreneurs out there with great ideas that want to get into business and they're looking for help. But they don't they they don't know how to do it themselves, and and so getting some help is a good step. And so when when I got the phone call from Shark Tank and they told me about the show, at, I said this is a great concept because on TV I know I get so much feedback from parents 
and from entrepreneurs that tell me that their children have learned from watching Shark Tank. And, and now people are starting more businesses. They're getting more uh, active. And I'll tell you the, the thing that, that's happening more so now is in the old days, people would always tell me, I have this idea or I had this idea, but I didn't do anything. I think Shark Tank is helping motivate people to actually take action. And because they're seeing people on the screen doing it and they're saying, if they can do it, so can I. So I think it's been an amazing kind of a, a way for people to visualize being an entrepreneur and, and taking those steps and taking action. It's great to see that all the sharks are here and on TV just because you want to help people. Really appreciate that. Okay. Um, that to the, to the more meat and bone stuff um, of Shark Tank. And I would like to ask a question on your best choice of startup so far um, and what makes it the best, according to you. Uh, maybe we can start with Lynn. Sure. Um, so I, I think as I mentioned earlier, I was a little bit sporadic in my investment choices in the first a couple of seasons. So I'm, I'm most excited about the companies I invested in in this season. Uh, right now, I'm super focused on education. And so uh, all, all of the companies have been in that area. Um, I have a background in it now. Um, I also have marketing channels. Are, are, uh, know, I know the value that I can add to the companies. And so uh, I, I think that the companies from this year um, are, are super exciting. And then if you want me to identify just one, um, it would be uh, EIY. Uh, that's a company that does um, public speaking training in English. Right? And I think uh, that is a super important skill, no matter what country you live in. Uh, you're going to be doing global business in English, uh, and you should be able to communicate the value that you bring. Uh, and so, I think this is a, a skill that um, that would be that really would really benefit not just people in Vietnam, but people in other emerging markets. Um, so, I'm hoping that whatever we build here can definitely be scalable into other emerging markets, and we'll be able to scale it globally. Mm. What about you, Luis? For for me, the the, the two views. Right, one is for investors. Uh, one the the what you call home run what that's the old old saying for Americans is like the home run like a baseball type of thing but the the, the term now is a unicorn right so a home run is is high multiples in return how many how many times did you get return investment so so for so and the other one is how you feel about the the experience with the team and so on a little more intangible so there was one investment we had in the U S when I was in venture capital we invested in a uh, a software security company. That, uh, that generated, eventually sold to NQTEL, which is the CIA venture capital fund, uh, which generated a very large multiple for us. And we're very pleased about that uh, because it took a lot of work, but, but it's not as uh, rewarding. Uh, money's nice, but that's, that as rewarding as uh, working with recently, we, we, we worked with a deal where uh, we were able to enter a deal where the entrepreneur, the CEO, the founder, knows the industry, not just a business guy, but technically knows the business, um, inside out co competition, product, uh, marketing, but also he, he has uh, an element where he cares about um, the other, the, the social issue, the environmental issue, and uh, how this product can, uh, it, how, how, how the current product is damaging, causing cancer, or so he's trying to solve pain points, right? So, so both, uh, you, you're not sacrificing return, but you're also solving social and environmental issues. So it made me feel much better by working with people like that, people that actually care not just about returns, but also about social and environmental issues. So that made me feel pretty good about working with this team and able to, to enter a deal like that. Louise and Kevin, I know that you helped a lot of companies and entrepreneurs to go um, to list on the stock exchange. So what is your best choice so far, do you think, and what makes it the best? Let me let me tell you about it. Um, again, I'm a, I, I love products, and so um, about eight years ago, um, I, it was actually nine years ago. A company, I don't know if you can see this. This is an energy drink called Celsius. Now, this this was a startup company um, that had just uh, gone under the uh, pink sheets of of a stock uh, exchange, and the stock was ten cents a share. It it had under a five million dollar value. But what they had was a great story. The product is a drink that gives you energy and, you know, and it will also, it's guaranteed and we have clinical studies that it will burn 140 calories just by drinking it. So it creates a metabolic 
uh, movement in your body and just drink it and you start burning calories. And so this became very big in the fitness arena. We grew this company. Uh, uh, we raised 30 million in the first tranche. Then we raised 70 million. This company now is, is a $5 billion company. The stock went from 10 cents to over $60. And, and it's, it's been in, in my world, because I'm a board member and investor and been with the company nine years to go from a couple million to 5 billion is a pretty, is a pretty solid performance. And this is, this is my unicorn and it's five times over a unicorn because it's a $5 billion company now. So that's been a really exciting project for me. And maybe there's somebody in Vietnam that might be interested in talking to us also. Who knows, you know? Yes, I would. I would, Kevin. Let's talk after. We do okay. drinks. <laughs> okay. All right. Good, good. Now, guys, so because you have your best, you probably have your worst as well. You probably make some, some bad decisions in your life about investing into startups. What is your worst choice of startup so far? And what are your learnings from it? Um, I'll start with you, Kevin, since you're here. Okay. So we dealt with a lot of celebrities for many years. And I mentioned, you know, George Foreman and the Kardashian family and 50 Cent and his headphones. But one day I got a, a gentleman came in. He was famous way back in the day. He, his name was Chubby Checker. And he had, his song was, let's do the twist. Okay. <laughs> Come on, let's do the twist. Right now he came in and he had a fitness product that was a twisting product and make a long story short, it was very expensive, it was cumbersome, but we got excited because Chubby Checker was, was famous in America as a singer who had a, a, a hit song. So we invested you know, a lot of money into this project. We had to do the tooling, the manufacturing, inventory, then we had to produce all the television spots. We had over $500,000 invested in just this one project and it was a total disaster, all right? And, and I say to myself that, you know, maybe we made a mistake thinking that we should invest in a fitness product with a man named Chubby, okay? So that, it did not work. It was a bad one for us. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Louis. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't have such a fun story like Kevin, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but uh, being well, while being early in Vietnam, I had to pay, I uh, had to have some scars on my back and what you call it, you get some arrows with your, your early comers. Um, so we invested in, uh, in a company in the space of healthcare where uh, um, the founder was very uh, eloquent and well-spoken person. Uh, and uh, have a really good ideas and, and, and establish businesses that are going really well. Uh, what, what, uh, we, we lost all the money in this investment because um, number one, we, uh, the, the contract that we put out, were, were, uh, you didn't have any downside protection or you didn't have enough experience to, to cover in case something happened. Like you always think of the divorce, right? So when you come in a marriage, you cannot think of the divorce, but in investment you do. Uh, so that's one thing is the downside protection clause. The other one is um, don't be fooled by what you the, by, by the cover of the book, uh, meaning what they show on the outside does not mean uh, what that's what it really is. Uh, so the, your due diligence has to be a lot deeper uh, in Vietnam, especially in private equity. Uh, and I paid the price for it, and we lost all the money, and uh, but uh, never again. So that was our lesson. What about, what about you, Lynn? What's your story? Um, I'd say my, the worst investment was the first company that I tried to start. Uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, I myself. I was, I was green and didn't really know what I was doing, although I thought I did. But um, yeah, it was a wedding dress company, custom wedding dresses online. And uh, the, the key lesson I learned there is, you know, interest does not equal revenue, right? So a lot of brides were very interested. We had you know, uh, interest up the wazoo, uh, emails every day, you know, when new customers come or new interest, interested people coming in, uh, but trying to get them to convert was really difficult. And um, realizing that brides are not crazy, brides just don't know what they want. Uh, right. And so that's the other thing is you're, if you're dealing with a customer that doesn't quite know what they want, uh, then, then you really can't fulfill those needs. Right. And so that's really hard as a a company trying to provide a service, you do have a quality product, but if it doesn't fit with what the customer wants, then there's, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, and if those, if the wants and needs are constantly changing, then you, you can't uh, possibly really meet that. 
Um, so, so we ended up pivoting and ended up doing much better in, in the next few uh, business models. But yeah, that first business model was a, a, a big eye-opening experience. Great story for people to learn from. Personal story. I love that. Okay, getting back to the investment part of um, startups. Um, people say that startup is um, probably the most risky business um, to be in and investing into startup is probably um, having about 1% success. But you guys have been investors for so long. So I'm curious to learn whether you've come up with a formula for investment into startups that uh, makes it uh, more successful in, in these days. Maybe start with you, Lynn. Um, sure. So yeah, there's not really a formula, uh, but there are certain key things you look for. So uh, PPM, a uh, people product market, right? So uh, first is always the team, right? Are they competent? Do they have the background? Are they able to be flexible and move with the market and potentially change the product? Because uh, you know, as statistics show, most of companies that are successful end up at a different place and a different product with a different business model than where they started, right? So the people are super important. And then the product. Right. Again, knowing that the product may change. However, when you first invest, you do want to know that the company has a strong product. They've already built it. First of all, right. They can't just be an idea or, or picture on a, on a napkin. They have to have built it uh, and try to find uh, customers for it. And then the market. Right. So is there demand for it? Uh, if, if you're trying to create custom wedding dresses, uh, are brides looking for custom wedding dresses? Right. And so you, you do need to know that, uh, you know, whatever the problem you perceive to be that you create a solution for, do other people have that same problem? And are there enough of them for you to really grow the, the business to, to, you know, to a good size? So that's PPM, that shot link. PPM. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> what about you, Louis? So, so I, I guess just, just a quick correction. I don't want our audience to have um, a misconception about what you said. You said it's only about uh, 1% out of, you know, one out of 100 startup will, will uh, Will survive well. I, well, you know, there, there's a Harvard uh, Business School study about startups a few years ago, and they say it's about between 90 and 95 percent. So you're not far off. So maybe less about 10 percent success. But but in in the world of venture capital, where I work in Silicon Valley or here, so you, you may want to break it down to a little bit further. So maybe one percent that would be like a, a home run and a unicorn, like a big IPO. But there's still like another five percent that eventually get bought out by other companies, and maybe. 10% would be what you call the walking dead. So, so they don't know anywhere, they're just flat. And the rest would be pure failures, like maybe the, the other 80%. So, so, so I don't want to uh, discourage uh, investors or, or startups like, oh my God, only 1% success, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so so that, that's number one. And, and uh, for, for us, like you, you're asking is, is how do you find this 1% success rate, right? So for each person have different formula. Uh, for, 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 for me, because we invest in the capital market, stocks, real estate, and uh, private equities, uh, established companies as well as startups. So our time has to be worthwhile. So we cannot come in as uh, some companies that has that covering a pain point or market that's too small. So that's very key, right? So if you're working on something, you better make sure you're addressing a, a big pain point, a big global issue, something that's cross-border, something that, uh, that addresses the pain point of a big, bigger market. So hence uh, a bigger return. So that's my point. Thank you. So um, I'm getting more positive now with one to 10% success rate. Uh, I have a formula that I use and, and I, I have um, a higher success rate in my product business. And, and let me explain why. Um, I have a, a formula I, I use, I call it test before I invest. And, and so somebody brings me a product what if it exists, what I like to do is, is we do a digital test where we build a digital funnel. We drive them, you know, and we run ads on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. We, we put a small budget of maybe five to $10,000 in media and, and run through a funnel. And then we see the response. It's like a focus group. What happens? Did people want to buy it? Did they buy it? Did they not buy it? What were the conversions? If we see positive results there, and for example, recently we 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 had a we built this, we had five thousand dollars in media that went to a product, and out of it came twenty-five thousand dollars in credit card orders. 
And I'm like, okay, now we can invest the big money in this project because that is doing a huge multiple. So we like to test before we invest. We will put it on a shopping channel like HSN or QVC. We will put it into a digital test. We will sell it to a catalog. We'll test it on Amazon. But before I invest millions, I'll invest 10,000 to, to do proof of concept to see that it works. And then I'm putting good money after a, a more solid, uh, a less risky proposition. Test before you invest. Such a great formula. I think a lot of investors will learn from it today as well. Just to be very curious about you guys being investor for, in, investors for so long, can you spot um, success straight away when you have like a five minute conversation with someone? Straight away. If I could spot that one, you know, it, I would be, I would have every deal in the world. No, that's the funny thing. Uh, it, when we test before we invest, oftentimes uh, if there's five products, I'll pick my two favorites. I may get one of them, but there's generally something that comes that is just mind blowing in terms of, oh my God, I didn't think this would be one that would work. So that's the amazing thing about what we do in investing is sometimes you just don't know until you make until you, until you put it out there. But um, yeah, I wish I could always spot those one percenters. I don't have that talent yet. <laughs> okay, touching on um, a little bit of the pandemic, has your appetite for investment changed pre-COVID and during COVID? And what is it? I'll start with you, Kevin. Yes. Um, so I had my best year ever during in, in the last 14, 16 months, uh, more, more than a year, obviously, at that point. But um, one of the things that was very powerful for me and, and my industry, again, because I'm in the business of selling direct to the consumer. And so during COVID, we were able to connect with our consumers via, directly via the things that I just mentioned via Facebook and Instagram. And so stores were closed. In fact, when I talked about this product, Celsius, everywhere that was selling Celsius for a while was closed, but our sales were going like this. Why? Because people were able to buy it direct to the consumer. We had Amazon channels and other places that they didn't have to go into the store. We also started utilizing Instagram influencers, micro influencers, and people that could connect with their friends and relatives. So they were telling their friends about it. Their friends were buying it. They didn't need to buy it through the store. So we found that our model of direct to the consumer ended up being way more powerful during COVID for several reasons. People were sitting at home. They weren't going to work. They were on their computers. They were watching television. They were, they were consumers. So um, yes, for me, COVID was an eye opener and it just further entrenched us into the direct to the consumer model with the products that we're involved with. Direct to consumers. Um, so what about you, Lynn? Have you changed your appetite um, pre and during COVID? Well, I think there were a lot of trends that have been happening before COVID, such as a lot of the offline services moving online. And COVID really just kind of helped to solidify all of those business models as legitimate, right? So in Vietnam, uh, e-commerce was already around, but you know people were hesitant. They wanted to see the product. They wanted to touch and feel. But COVID came and they kind of had to buy. And then now, as people are used to it, people don't want to go away from that. They enjoy the convenience. Right. So it's something that really enabled uh, people to start really adopting things. Right. For example, um, uh, virtual meetings. Right. That was all that's been around for so long. Right. Cisco WebEx. You've got GoToMeeting. Uh, right. But now all of a sudden Zoom came comes in because they needed a you know, consumer version. They need something a little bit cheaper for, for small businesses. And now everybody's used to it. Right. So uh, for myself, even, you know, uh, before COVID, I was already thinking about the edtech space. Uh, and, you know, when, when COVID hit, it was just kind of made sense, right? Um, as people started spending more time at home and wanted to do more learning and to improve themselves because maybe they lost their jobs and they, they needed to upskill. And so I think there are a lot of opportunities that came out from it. Uh, and, and it's really a matter of identifying which ones really make sense for the investor or for the entrepreneur and then go, going that route. Hmm. Thank you. What about you, Luis? 
I think there's enough said. Uh, I have nothing to add. All right, we move on to the next question. Um, and the question is focusing on startup going global. So for you to invest into a startup, um, do you place importance in that particular startup um, being able to go global, serving regional and global uh, global markets or domestic markets is okay with you? I'll start with you, Luis. I just said earlier that one of the key things for us is addressing a large market. And a large market means global. To it, it has to be cross-border, meaning it has cannot be language sensitive or cannot be culturally sensitive. Thank you. What about you, Lynn? Yeah, I think uh, you know, this is an interesting topic because everybody in Vietnam and most people in Southeast Asia really think about going outside of whatever country they're in. And then some people say Singapore needs to start regional even from the get-go because they're so small, right? Uh, but I think that in order for that to work, you really need a strong home base, right? Because in every country you go into, there are new things you have to learn, whether it's the, the language, the culture, you have to customize the product. And so if you're not solid at home, you don't have that base, you don't have the revenue and that profit to really fuel the growth outside of the country, then you're, you're kind of leaving yourself susceptible to all the other risks. So I think, yes, I would like a product to go regional and global, but I think the entrepreneur needs to be really focused on building home base first, um, you know, becoming number one, number two, potentially number three in the Vietnam market, um, only because for most industries, it's kind of winner take all or top three, or right? you can't really be below that. And then once you get there, then you can start growing broadly. Uh, but I think you have you got to go deep first. What's your view on that, Kevin? I, I love the global aspect because products, if we found in, in our business model over the, over the last 40 years, if something worked in the United States, it was a kitchen product, a fitness product, it generally was gonna work in most other countries around the world. So initially I, I opened up my own operations. I opened an office in London to, to run our infomercials all across Europe. We opened an office in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia to go across the Middle East and in, in Sao Paulo to go across Latin America and over in Tokyo of the beachhead to go in, in, in parts of Asia. But um, that was very expensive. We had, we had a solid company that had the capital to be able to open those offices and, and afford to buy the inventory because it, when you do it yourself, you have all the expense. We had to open the office, sign the leases, hire the employees, inventory the products, buy the media. That took millions of dollars tens of millions in some of these markets. And so that's one way to go, but most people don't have the, the ability to do that. So I recommend licensing or partnering in those earlier days where, and even now today, I don't run my own operations around the world. I have partners or affiliates in most markets so that when I go to England, I've got somebody that I can license it to, I get my money up front because I wholesale it, make a profit. I don't have to put up any capital. And, and I just receive the benefit of the profit on the front end as opposed to waiting for profits after the business matures. So, so licensing and finding the right kind of partners is always a good thing. And of course, on that note, I know there's been partners I've used in Vietnam over the years, but if there's anybody out there that's interested in some of the products we have in the Vietnam market, we definitely would be interested in those discussions also, because we, we've spent the money and the time to find winning successes here in the United States. Now we'd like to partner with the best of the best around the world. So Louis was That's interesting. It's it interesting you say that, Kevin, because um, Fivon and I were just talking before the show that she and I should do some investments together. So maybe we can talk and see what we can bring into the Vietnam market. Sure. Thank you. All right. Kevin, are you aware of the startup ecosystem in Vietnam? And uh, what do you think um, What do you think about it? Um, and do you know any Vietnamese startups um, in Vietnam? And would you have interest in uh, investing into Vietnam or other things later on? So uh, good questions. And I, I will say, as far as the ecosystem goes, I, I am I'm not an expert there. I, I, I'm, I appreciate this opportunity to meet um, many of, of the, the fellow sharks, as well as folks in Vietnam that will uh, be hearing uh, this recording and, and looking forward to connecting with entrepreneurs. So I think this is 
Uh, over the years, I've done business in many, many countries and Vietnam has, has not been uh, one of my biggest markets and, I, and I'd, I'd like to change that. But you know, one of the things that I recommend for entrepreneurs, uh, today the, the market is, it, it's so difficult to get capital. And, and so I got involved with, the, with a company in the US raising capital equity wise crowdfunding and um, Kendrick uh, Wynn is is a Vietnamese is is a gentleman who brought me uh, to this platform here today, and I, I believe that when I was a young entrepreneur, banks weren't lending money to young entrepreneurs, and so in today's world, it's it there's more options out there, and and I just want to stress that um, in 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 looking at building your business. Don't forget about equity crowdfunding sites because these are very, very powerful. Keep that in mind. And, and that's a, a good way to get, get some capital in addition to Shark Tank, okay? <laughs> uh, Kevin mentioned um, about crowdfunding and uh, it seems like uh, lots of people are talking about it these days. Um, quite a few investors um, have been on uh, crowdfunding platforms as well as a venture capitalist. What do you think about it? Yeah, I like it. Because I think it's a great way to test the market, right? Uh, you you definitely want to know if there is a market for it, right? That's one of the things that you need to understand before you go into business in any particular sector is, is there a market need and a market ability to pay for that product? So I think uh, crowdsourcing is a great way to understand, are people willing to pay for this, right? And that's one of the painful um, lessons that I learned is interest does not equal revenue, right? Mm -hmm. So People need to show interest by saying, here, here's my money, here's my credit card, right? And so when you use a crowdfunding platform, people are voting with their money and that's what you need and that's what you should use to decide if the company should continue to grow or mm -hmm. if you should spend time thinking of another idea, right? So I, I like the platform. Hmm. You agree with that, Luis? Yeah, I think it's good. But uh, I think it has some risk element for, for the people that put money in um, because and, and it depends on where it's regulated. In Vietnam, I'm not sure you can do that. So late, earlier, uh, Kevin mentioned the Republic because if you raise money, if you have a platform to raise money from the people of Vietnam, from the citizen of Vietnam, you need a license. So you may have to make sure that it's a, the regulatory issue will uh, accept that. Right. So the platform, you have to be careful uh, that the law allows you to raise capital over the Internet. So crowd, you can talk about things all you want, but you have to make sure the government's OK with it. Uh, for, for us as foreign investors, we never take any shortcut. So, so therefore, um, we always have to abide by the law. So that's the first thing. Uh, does it um, does the law of Vietnam allow you to do crowdfunding? And secondly, um, the investor, the people that put money in. Uh, they're at risk. Like, let's say you invest in Bitcoin or you invest in land in Gucci or anywhere. Like, if, if, some, if, if someone cheats you or something, who's going to protect you? Who's going to protect you? Um, so so in, in developed countries, the government steps up and regulate that. You cannot simply go out and say, this vitamin will make uh, me strong as an ox. Uh, uh, Sun Lee, and, the, and the, or this, this will cause my, less pain in my ankle, or like I can sleep better, things like that, right? Where's the science behind that? And how, what makes me as a person saying that's true and correct as a financier or a KOL or whatever? So anyway, my point is crowdfunding is good, but the two things, number one, does the law of Vietnam allow it? And number two, uh, it, it has to have some disclosure. Let's assume it allow, the law allows it. The investor is at risk, not the company will receive. What if the company is a fake? If, if so, they lost money, then who's going to protect them? Then that crowdfunding source will be liable for it or what? You see, so there are many issues you need to address before you can say like, yeah, it's good, but will it work in Vietnam? Fantastic. Okay, before we wrap up the show, just one more question before you have to leave. If there is one keyword you want to leave to all the startup founders watching the show today um, to keep them encouraged and engaged and would like to go ahead and, um, and uh, be great entrepreneurs in the future, what would be that one word that you would like to leave to them? Kevin, I start with you. Okay, I'll start. I think dream team can be one word, okay? So let's make it one word. Um, I, I believe, uh, I made a mistake when I was a young entrepreneur. 
I, I, I had too much ego. I thought I was invincible and didn't want to, I didn't want to hire ex people that I needed like a strong CFO and pay them the right money. I didn't appreciate enough the other people's uh, skill sets. And so as I was growing, we had trouble in operations and finance, which weren't my skill sets. Once I realized the mistakes I made, paid my dues, I, I said, no, I need the best people I can afford, that I can find. And maybe even sometimes I say, don't even just get what you can afford, but you need to know where are you going? Where is your business going? In other words, it, if you're a million dollar business today, but you're going to be a hundred million dollar business in three years, don't hire a CFO that's a million dollar CFO. Look for that CFO that is the hundred million dollar guy because he's going to help you get there. Now he's going to cost you a little more, but maybe you could do a little barter deal, less salary, a little piece of equity. There's ways to do this, but surround yourself with the best of the best, digital marketing people, finance people, operations people, et cetera. So um, I just believe now I'd much rather pay the best people what they need to be paid because they're going to give me the greatest advice and help us be more successful. Get the right dream team. That's my one word. It might be two, but let's call it one today, okay? <laughs> Dream team, the one, two word from Shot Kevin. What about you, Lynn? Uh, I say my favorite word is optimism, right? Because I think uh, to be an entrepreneur, to be successful in anything, you know, to be a mom, uh, to, to be, uh, you know, a good person, you have to be optimistic. Because really behind, what, behind the word optimism is a lot of other meanings, right? Life is hard. You're going to face a lot of obstacles. You get kicked down by life. You're going to get beat up, right? And the person that can stand back up and, you know, brush it off and start over, that's the person that will succeed, right? And the person that can do that is a person that is optimistic, that can find the, the silver lining and everything, and that can just really focus on getting things done and focus on the good things in life. And so I think everybody needs to be optimistic. Optimistic. That's one key word from Shaq Lin. What about Shaq Louis? Well, the, the dream team idea is great and optimism is also great, I think. And uh, um, I, I think let's assume that we have a dream team and optimism. Uh, I, I would uh, add to that to, uh, to always important in our field in investor investment in uh, fund management, venture capital, private equity is, is integrity. Integrity that goes uh, has to be uh, come down to the, the startup level also is that um, it has to do with transparency. It has to do with uh, governance. It has to do with respecting shareholders and, and values. Uh, so that way your product is, uh, is, is, is honest. Is it, uh, it's addressing a, a clear message and you're, and, and you're doing uh, things that are meaningful, but at the same time, um, a, sin, a sincerity, a sense of integrity will, will show through. And I think as an investor, when you, uh, you come across folks that are has a sense of integrity, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, adds part of the valuation. You want to work with a management team who are, uh, have integrity, that, are, that are, they care about what they do, um, they, they do, they follow what they say, and they're honest. So that's important to us. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for taking your time out. And thank you for being on Weaker, our Risk and Opportunities talk show. Um, I thank you all very much. And I hope that we have a chance to meet you all again and ask you questions again in, in future shows. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good being here. Thank you. So there you go, my friends. You have heard from all the shots today about what it takes to be a good startup, what it takes to go global, and what it takes to build a fantastic startup ecosystem for Vietnam to be able to be part of the ecosystem in the world. I hope that you have learned a lot from the shots, but remember, there are three keywords that you need to write down and you need to help you grow in the future. From Shark Kevin, dream team. It's always about the dream team, so pay a lot of attention to that. From Shatlin, optimism. You got to be optimistic, positive to be able to go ahead, to be able to be part of the future, to be able to integrate into the future. And from Shark Louis, integrity, which is super, super important for you to be able to um, pitch to the investors and for you to be able to work with investors from anywhere in the world. And with that, 
Fivan and the team at Nguyga, we would like to say thank you very much for your participation. We have to say goodbye for now, but we hope to meet you again very soon in future shows. So goodbye everyone, stay safe and stay very positive. Cùng Nguyễn Phi Vân trong talk show Nguy cơ phát sóng thứ năm hàng tuần trên vnexpress.net.